Shalom once again. I'm so excited to see so many of you. Thank God for having me to be in MEC. This is my second time here. First time I still remember was sitting here recording podcasts. That was my first time. And uh, now I see so many young people, I get very excited, very anxious. <laughs> so happy that uh, also I must thank the Reverend Cho for having me, inviting me and uh, into, uh, to MEC, uh, that is a Mega English Celebration, a very unique church. And I see there's so many young people and I'm enjoying myself to worship together with young people. Give yourself an, another clap because you are here. <laughs> Just for your information, I started as a youth pastor right, in my church. And I think I was the, one of the oldest pastor or oldest youth pastor. Right? But uh, nowadays, it's not easy to get young people coming together um, to worship God together. Right? So this, where, where should I point? Let, let me get myself here. All right, okay. Not moving. Oh, it's moving. Okay. Now the world we are living in now lacks peace. Do you agree with me? Right? The wars are breaking out e everywhere, such as now, uh, you know, the Russia and Ukraine war. In Gaza, we also see that the Israel and the Hamas war, in, which involving Iran as well, then they send so many uh, uh, drones, a few hundred drones, just to attack that country, Israel. And we know that this war, they are not going to stop anytime. And this conflict has also spread to the American universities, in campuses, I think if you read the news, the, uh, there are two divides eh, in those who support Israel Hamas. They came together as uh, undergraduate students and then they have had their protests and they, they, you know, then they fought and then they have this um, problem with the authorities as well. Now, furthermore, the tension also between two super houses in China, uh, uh, in, in the world, as China and the United States. Um, this is uh, not new issue. They, we always see that uh, the, the Americans is accusing they are so afraid of China, right? So they want to have the economic sanction. Uh, they, 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 they want to stop them. They are so afraid about TikTok, so afraid about what else, Huawei, right? Just recently, I came back from Guangzhou. And I got a shock about China, how advanced they are, and about that electric car. If you actually watch a video of uh, Xiaomi, right? They they built electric car nowadays um, uh, and a fully automated um, factory in, in that country, you know. So they have gone, gone beyond, beyond uh, the Americans. So they, they created some conflicts as well. Political, political divisions between countries are so evident. Among other, like North Korea, South Korea, forever fighting, they never stop fighting. Right. For example, even back in our home country, in Malaysia, that we see that the different opposition parties are arguing, accusing each other every day. This is not news to us. So, some people say when there are people, that when there are human beings, uh, there will be conflict. Do you agree with me? Once you have human beings, there are conflicts. But not only human beings can create conflicts, you know, the animals are also experiencing conflicts. Animals, they fight one another, right? Um, what else? Animals, they, when they are very hungry, they eat one another. Do you know that? Fish eat one another. Crocodile can eat one another. So conflicts cannot, not only happening among human beings, animals as well. But when we talk about conflicts here, right? do you see that it happens in the various aspects of lives? In our lives, that we see conflicts. Right? There are different spheres that we see conflicts. The interpersonal relationship so frequently occur when we have tension among family members. Some of us are actually experiencing um, conflicts, um, disharmony in the family, friends as well. Uh, I don't like you, you don't like me, la. great. Yeah, this always happens in the primary school among girls. Huh? <laughs> uh, most of the time, boys also like that, you know. I don't want to friend you already. So, among friends, different communication styles lead to misunderstanding, leads to disagreement, 
Of course, in another sphere, that uh, I think most of you are young adults that, uh, uh, you know, either you are undergraduates or you are young adults working in the marketplace. When you work in the marketplace, wow, workplace conflicts arise. Corporate politics, office politics. Why? Why these people having conflicts in the office place? Because they could have different goals, different work style, different personalities between employees or, you know, between employees and management. So issues such as competition for resources, that we fight one another for resources. Power struggle always happen. Disputes over responsibility lead to office politics, work conflicts. I always, uh, you know, before I was a past, I'm a pastor, I was actually a, a corporate consultant as well. So I, you know, people's problem is my business, uh, wonderful. The more, the more conflicts are there, more business I get because I will have to go and resolve conflicts. Right? So in the community, conflicts can occur within communities like social group, different cultural backgrounds that you see, social economic status, political belief that I've just mentioned, create a lot of tension and conflicts over resources, land use, and community development. Right? People are constantly fighting for land. If you look at the Bible, Land is very important, right? And, and when God sends his children take over, it's all about land. So when you want to take over people's land, fight, la, war, right? Yesterday, Putin, I think the Russian uh, prime, uh, president, he, he, he said he never launched missile. He didn't want to launch nuclear weapon. Um, he said it's not about land issue. I don't know. He knows very well. But surprisingly, when we talk about Russia and um, Ukraine, do you know that they both are Christian nations? And both leaders are Christians. Hey, what happened to these people? Right? What is in their mind? Family as well. We also always have conflict that sphere that commonly happen uh, due to um, siblings' rivalry, I do not know. Disagreement between parents and children that's always happening now. Um, more of children disagreeing with the parents, uh, not parents disagreeing with children. Right? So they, that's the disputes, or sometimes over inheritance. Then the old man dies, then people start to have conflicts and go after one another, you know, because of the, the wealth. You know, they can sue one another. You know, when we grow up together as a childhood siblings, but when we grow, wow, the old man died already, I'll sue you, I'll see you in court. Those days when we were young, I see you in badminton court. We play badminton. Why now see you in the legal courts? So all this well, um, issue related to communication breakdown, generation gaps, unresolved past conflicts leads to family disputes. The other sphere, that's the legal judicial system, which can arise with the legal, uh, including disputes within individuals and organizations. So conflicts between citizens and authorities, and controversies over the interpretation or enforcement of law can also create conflicts. Not only interpretation of law, I think sometimes in the church, uh, different interpretation of the Bible also create conflicts. You say you are wrong, I'm right, I'm right, you are wrong. Okay, always say that you think you interpret correctly, right? So Bible interpretation, you don't just look at the, the face value, right? You must look into textual criticism. Anyway, today I'm not talking about Bible interpretation. But another sphere, global and geopolitical conflicts at the global scale, just now I've already mentioned nation, government, ge geopolitical entities. So disputes over territory resources, political ideologies, right? Uh, geopolitical influence lead to conflicts ranging from diplomatic tensions to armed confrontation like, you know, Russia, um, of course, with Ukraine. Now, religion, that is the sphere that we always face, this sphere, this area, conflicts, because we have differences in religious belief, of course. Different religion that already has conflict, different ideologies will create conflicts, different worldview as well. But among ourselves, we as a Christian community, right, also have conflicts, right, that, that will tra give threats to Identity, give threats to value, and give threats to a lot of grievances. 
So we need to understand that the common areas of conflicts arise uh, is crucial for effectively managing and resolving conflicts in many con contexts. But then we have to ask ourselves, um, what are the causes of conflicts? What are the causes? There are many causes, right? Let's not go into detail. Of course, differences in goals, interests, personal interests, values, problem perception, communication style, you know, create conflicts. Sometimes if you do not know how to communicate well, then create conflicts. And power, most of the time, is power and status that we create conflicts. Insecurity among ourselves, resistance to change, when MBC wants to change and Omega Church wants to change or whatever, some people refuse to change, create conflicts. Let me tell you this. The constant factor in life, do you know what is the constant factor in life? We refuse change, right? But the constant factors in life is change. I don't like change too. But I have to cope, I have to learn to change. Role confusion, this is one of the problems in families, create conflicts. Uh, my wife and I, I, we have been in a premarital counselling for more than 15 years. So all the young people getting ready to get married, they will come to this role of husband and wife. You know, we always ask our counsellee in your home, who is the head of the family? Most of our counsellees say, my mother. <laughs> Aloma, no wonder like, you got conflicts. The mother is supposed to be submission, to submissive to the husband. But the husband or the father at home, the one to take the role of the head, the pass the role, everything else to mother. Lah. So you have role confusion that will create conflicts. Of course, poor communication, or sometimes we self-searching for our identity, personal needs, and self-centeredness is always one of the main cause of conflicts. Just now we have actually read, uh, Brother William has read the... Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Just help me. Nah, the, okay. Eh? You see my action like that? I press a few times, then you know what to do. Lah, because I have AI as it said there. <laughs> what is the background of Ephesians that Brother William had just read just now? Because Paul, who wrote this episode, when he was in prison, right? most of the time, you know, when you're in prison, you, you probably do not know what to do, but of course none of us are in prison before. And during the AD or the current era of 60-62, what was he writing? He was dealing with the disunity issue in the church at Ephesus. During that time, the church had been so disunited. So he wrote this letter to tell the churches what to do. And you see all most of his letters, episodes, is actually warning, giving instructions to the church. So when he wrote this about this unity of the Ephesians church, does this sound a lot more like what we are in our church today? This unity is one of the key issues. Brothers and sisters in Christ, looks like we all never learn from history. We don't like to learn from history. We, we have learned nothing. We argue and hurt one another, each other, because of different theological views. Do you know that if you study the church history, then people argue about infant baptism. Some denominations, they don't believe in infant baptism. Methodists, we do. And during your church history, they argue until they fight one another, they kill one another. Because you believe, uh, I'm going to search you at home and I'm going to kill you. Christians, you know, killing another Christians. Because of infant baptism. There are also different methods of baptism. Oh, Halil, come on. Methodists, we use sprinkling. There's another way that is pouring. And then, of course, there's another way, probably the Baptists, they believe in immersion. Right? I do not know about your style, but I think sometimes you do emotion. We have no problem. Right? Some of you, if you baptize sprinkling, you think the water not enough, tell your pastor again, they can give you more water. They soak you in the swimming pool. No issue. Don't have to kill one another. Don't have to fight one another. But the church history tells us that we fight one another. We have conflict. 
These are not biblical truth. These are not dogmas. These are just tradition. These are just practices. And sometimes you want to call it theology, not really theology. I never learned theology or baptism before in seminary, unless I'm wrong or went to the wrong seminary. Right? What is dogma? Jesus is Christ, the Lord. That is dogma. You want to kill one another? I think, okay, I can accept. If you fight one another, you say Jesus is not Lord. Then I say Jesus is Lord. That is a conflict. That is the dogma issue. But not over this issue. Right? So we, we have just read just now, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. So in verse 1, Paul says to be a prisoner of the Lord. Now he was in prison and said to be prisoner of the Lord, meaning to say it was the price that Paul paid for the calling. Because there is a price he paid for a calling and the gifts that he received. So he uses this to remind every believer that the cost we must bear when we live life. We must live a life that worthy of the calling that we have received. All of us are called. All of us are called. So when we are called, we need to bear fruits. What fruits do you want to bear? Musang king, black thorn, fruit of the spirit. In Galatians chapter 5. Then Paul says that we need to bear fruits like humility, gentleness, patience, love and peace. Because this is what we have just read. And this aligns with the position of being the heir together. We are the children of God. We are member of one body. Amen. Are we member of one body? No response. The mic is not working. <laughs> yes, we are. And we share together the promises of God. Am I? Am I right? Amen. Yes. And we are striving to maintain the unity of the body of Christ. This is what God has put all of us together. Because we are the same body. So the second one, he says that what we should we do in verse 2, part A, he says we must always be gentle, humble and gentle, and be patient with each other. Paul has given us the way how we maintain unity. Alright? First he says that always be humble. What does it mean to be humble? I do not know how many of us are humble. Put up your hands. Very good, huh? You know my trick. Huh? <laughs> if anybody go and tell people, hey, I'm humble, I'm humble, you know, I'm humble, I don't think you're humble, right? So today you never raise up your hand. Hallelujah, you have a lot of hope in this church. <laughs> I don't know. I don't hope to see people raise up hand. Anyway, humility places Christ first. Jesus Christ first. Humanity places other people second and ourselves last. But many times, unfortunately, we live a life that we put ourselves first. We put others second and we put God last. Right? It, so, humility is the example of Jesus Christ. Because humility is the opposite of pride. Pride is one of the greatest things. Now, of course, in Greek culture, humility was seen as weakness of slaves. But Apostle Paul emphasized the importance for our everyday life because pride is the most destructive force against unity. Do you agree with me? Why there's a lot of disunity? It is also because a lot of pride in the community. So, humility is not about pretending to be humble out of courtesy. It is about believers, ourselves, the true understanding of ourselves. We as believers, we as Christians, do you know yourself? It is about thinking oneself in sober judgment by the faith God has distributed to each of us. That means to see that it is seeing the holiness and glory of God. We must recognize that God is holy. We must recognize that God is glorious. So we are being compelled to acknowledge one's utter depravity. It is understanding our weakness. It is understanding is by our gra the grace of God that we are safe. It is not that through ourselves, the how we work that we are safe. It is all through faith. And it is not about 
ourselves. It's not from ourselves. If you read the Purpose Driven Life, you know, Rick Warren, you have read this book many times, maybe at least one time. You know, the first page you say, it's not about you, it's not about me, it's all about God. We need to acknowledge that. If we don't acknowledge that, we are not humble at all. We don't recognize that God is almighty. So, it is by grace that we have been saved, which will allow us to see God's grace in other people leading to the attitude of in humility, value other people. That's how we are humble. Secondly, when Paul says that we need to be gentle. Gentle is not about weakness. Sometimes you say, while well, being gentle, you get bullied. Eh? Or better don't be gentle. Sometimes when you say servanthood leader is that while well, you serve other people, I better don't be leader because they will bully me. Right? Gentle doesn't mean weakness, but it's actually a controlled strength. God has given us this strength because it is a self-sacrificing example of Christ. So we are not insisting about our rights. Now there is a lot of movement about human rights. Now we have to be very careful. You know, when we talk a lot about rights, about our rights, then we will probably sway away from the biblical truth. We refrain from using words to provoke or harm people. That is gentle. Because our tongue is a double-edged sword, eh? We can praise people, we can harm people. We can tarnish people, we can kill people, no need to use nuclear weapon. You can use your tongue to kill a person. Do you agree with me? Yeah. You critique the person, you criticize the person, you condemn the person, you accuse the person. Then the person will go so low, so low, and then go home and he jump from 18 stories building. So you can kill one person through your tongues. A gentle person is not a weak pushover, but rather somebody like Moses, who was humble. Who is somebody like Jesus, who was meek and humble. Why? Because they still display anger when people offended God. I do not know whether do you display anger when people offended Jesus Christ. So if they do that, then you get angry. It's, I think it's perfectly all right. It doesn't mean that you are gentle. That means you will be bullied by them. Gentleness is the Holy Spirit empowering our inner strength to such a degree that we can accept Jesus Christ's rule in our heart. So that when Jesus Christ come enter into our heart, rules in our heart, we will remain undisturbed by other people. We are not so easily being stirred up by what other people say about you. So that we are not controlled by our own emotion. We don't want to be emotional. That is gentleness. Now we, 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 we hear about EQ, right? We hear about IQ, EQ. Nowadays, many Q. You got CQ, SQ, barbecue. <laughs> when we go to work, when you thought that you only need IQ, but nowadays in the marketplace, I tell you a lot of employers are seeking potential employees. They want to hire with EQ. That means they know how to control their emotion. They, need, they know how to manage their emotion. That is gentleness. Of course, the third one that Paul has asked us to be patient with one another so that we maintain unity. I think this is very challenging for all of us to be patient. Patient means endurance, which is God's kindness towards those who persist in disobedience. It is also human faith in God's sovereignty. So only when we believe truly understand the hope of to which he has called all of us, then we demonstrate genuine patience in living harmoniously within the body of Christ. You want to practice patience? I give you a tip. You want to learn how to be patient? I give you a tip. You want to hear the tips? To be a pastor of a church. You will sure learn patience. I learned patience a lot from my Sifu who just retired Reverend Ho. Not your Reverend Ho, like my Reverend Ho in KLCMC. 27 years pastoring KLCMC before that Hokkien Church, you need a lot of patience. To be a pastor, you need a lot of patience. When I was in seminary, my lecturer told us, he said, oh, if you want to be respected, uh, very good, go and become pastor. 
Because when you go to church, everybody will call you, Pastor, good morning, peace be with you, Pastor. Well, you feel very shocked. Huh? People call you Pastor. Then after that, I come into the ministry, and then my mentor, Pastor, told me, you want to be Pastor, you need to be thick skin. Your face, thick skin. Stomach also must be thick skin. That's why you see my stomach a little bit come out. Huh? Because they always feed you with food. They bring you for good food. Then the other thing, that the one, the thick skin, is you have to thick skin. Your food must be thick skin because you need to walk extra mile for Jesus Christ. So patience is something that we need to learn. This is something that is so important. The three important parts, humility, gentleness, and patience so that we maintain unity. Then after that, we will make allowance for each other's fault because of your love that is in phase, uh, verse 2, second part. Making allowances for each other's fault means to tolerate each other's weaknesses and failures. How much can we tolerate people's weaknesses? Now, there's a lot of young people don't stay in the church because the older people, the LKK people, I'm not the, that old, uh, LKK, you know what's LKK? Lao Kok Kok lah. That's why I saw that I heard your, your retreat go to RKK. Thank God it's not LKK. <laughs> right? They cannot tolerate the, the weaknesses of the young people or the failures or the mistakes that were made. That's why you cannot retain the young people in the church. We need to accept each other's personality and differences. It's so important. This is so important more so for husband and wife. Husband and wife, when you get married, you always feel that, okay, when I get married, I want to change you. No, 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 no. You don't change your spouse. You change yourself. You accept everything your spouse has. Good things and bad things. Okay? Including how the spouse squeezes your toothpaste, how he sleeps, how he snores. That is accepting everything, making allowance. Only when Christ reigns in our heart and becomes our Lord, allowing us to be rooted and established in love, then only we can bear with one another. So to bear with one another, we need to allow Christ through the Spirit rule in our hearts. Stay in our hearts and rule. Then only we can love one another. John, book of John says that when you love one another, that's another new command that Jesus has given to us. When you love one another, people will know that we are the disciples of Christ. So love one another, you need God to rule in our hearts. So we need to make in verse 3, when it comes to verse 3, Paul says, make every effort to keep yourself united in spirit, binding yourself together in peace. Now this is a very important words that we need to pay attention to. That is united in spirit. It is not about administrative unity when we talk about united in spirit. It is not about superficial harmony. We come to this church, touch and go, smile, okay. At home also, just, just you know, wearing a mask in the workplace or putting a, a fake smile, no. Or compromising with falsehood. It doesn't mean that when people commit crime, uh, commit an offense, uh, they do something wrong, then you compromise. You, you go and then compromise with them. That is not unity in spirit. But rather, about diverse members of the body of Christ, every one of us are very different when we have the same Holy Spirit at work within us. And the same Jesus Christ well, as one Christ that's dwelling in us. This will enable us to fellowship with one another. Our Christian community is so important, stress about fellowshipping, becoming heirs together, all right, that of a member of one body and share together with the promise of God, just as we have mentioned in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. So when we talk about unity, it's, uh, uh, you know, united in the spirit, it's a spiritual reality. What is this spiritual reality? Uh, reality? Which means this unity already accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen? When Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us, He has actually not only done the salvation for us, and He has actually united us through Holy Spirit. How did He unite us when He died on the cross through Holy Spirit? We are the Gentile Christians. We are not the chosen Jews. 
But when Jesus died for us, we know that the salvation is not only for the chosen people of God, the Jews, but it's also for we Gentiles believers. So the Jews and the Gentile believers have been made into one new man by Christ. Amen. So all of us have been united so, so that we can actually make peace. So brothers and sisters in Christ, when we are here congregating together, when we call ourselves Christians, the followers of Christ, we don't need to create unity because that has been done for us by Jesus Christ through His Spirit. But let me tell you this, let me remind every one of us here, even though I say that we do not need to create unity, please, we have the responsibility not to destroy unity that Christ has given us. So we need to make every effort because the Bible, Paul tells us, make every effort to keep this unity. Not go and do every effort, try to think of some way, some strategy, go and have secret group, strategize how to break the church, how to divide the church, how to destroy the unity. No. When did the Bible tell you to do this? But Paul, through the Bible, the Word of God, tells us not to destroy unity because this unity has been done through the blood of Jesus Christ, through His crucifixion and His resurrections. So we have been united. And through the Holy Spirit has united all of us. So we need to keep this, demonstrate the testimony of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is to be united. Paul has also used the body of Christ, the example of our body, to describe what is the body of Christ. The body has got different parts. You have the ears, you have the eyes, you have the nose, you have the hands. Can the eyes one day come and tell your body, right? Or tell the hands and say, now I'm the eyes, I can see 100 meters away. I can go there without you, telling the legs. Or the legs will tell the eyes and say, what's so big deal about you? I can bring the body to the, the front without you seeing the place. Then you are just long kang, you know? Without the eyes telling you where to go. So you got to work together as a body of Christ. Then today, like this morning, you had so wonderful, so powerful praise and worship team. Do you think they are great? Wonderful. I wish my teams are like that, you know. Maybe you all can come teach us a little bit. You know, your, your service is huh, very, very different, you know, because you're very English. <laughs> Why do you laugh? That means my English service are very Chinese. <laughs> Maybe because you are bilingual service. But hallelujah, praise God to your team. But your praise leader is so wonderful, he cannot say, I don't need keyboard today. I don't need keyboardists. I don't need drummers. You can't. Because they need to be a body to form together. The way to maintain unity is to bond together in peace. This is not a matter of compromising between people, but letting the peace of Christ rule in our heart. God, Paul has mentioned about peace. Rule in our hearts for him because Jesus Christ is peace himself. So when we allow Jesus Christ to rule in our heart, we are allowing peace to rule in our heart. So I do not know whether you, you are always being very hostile or you are always being very, very peace yourself. God calls every one of us to be peacemaker. God never called every one of us to be troublemakers. But most of us love and enjoy to be troublemakers. Why? You want attention? Many times we don't realize that we are egocentric. I always tell people that we have three best friends besides your mobile phone. Your mobile phone sure guarantee is your best friend. Why? Eat also, you take your mobile phone. Sleep also, you take your mobile phone to sleep with you. You go toilet also, you take mobile phone. You don't take newspaper nowadays, right? Eh? Some old people will tell you they must read magazine before they go to the toilet. Every time my wife goes to the toilet, got these habits. Eh? Ah, I need to find magazine. Eh? I say, why? No magazine cannot be right. Eh? I say, take your phone in. Lah. So many things to see. He said, no, 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 no. So dirty after the phone dropped into the toilet bowl. Right? So who are the three best friends? Why are we so egocentric? Because we have these three best friends. 
these three best friends whose names are me, I, myself. So you always mingle with these three best friends, me, I, myself. So that's why you are so egocentric. So many times that we are troublemakers, we thought that we are serving God faithfully. We thought that we are doing God a favor. But God wants us to be the worst of honor in serving Him. Sometimes unknowingly, without consciously, we have become tools for the devil when come to unity in the body of Christ. We thought that we are doing God a favor. Now this is a photo I've tried to search a lot, tried to search from the internet and finally find this photo. If you look at this photo, the bottom one is actually, we are the Christians and who is riding on our shoulders? The devil. The devil are riding on each Christian's shoulders. If you are not careful, if we allow the devil to come and start pointing finger and start accusing one another. Don't we think so? So we thought that we are doing God's a favor, but actually the devil is using the same strategy when they tempted Adam and Eve. So the devil has always been using the same strategy now to divide the church, to divide the body of Christ, to create disunity. So that you think that you are doing the God a favor, but no. We allow the devil, everyone. We need to use some spiritual goggles to see whether God devil's riding on our shoulders or not. Better shoot them away. Say in the name of Jesus Christ, don't ride on me, don't ride on me. Right? So when you start accusing one another in the body of Christ, then we have this problem. How many of you have been to uh, Pavilion Kuala Lumpur shopping mall? Pavilion. Don't worry, this is not a trick question. Be honest lah. <laughs> So few ah, oh, la, don't be shy lah. I also have been there. You know, before that, I think the older people will know. Before Pavilion, you know what was the place? Huh? School BBGS. You from BBGS? No. Be behind BBGS, do you know what is that? What was the place? Right, Wellers Swimming Pool. Have you been there? Yeah, most of the time, huh? In my generation and generation, I think different. Huh? <laughs> but we swim in the same pool. I, I went to a school, uh, the Methodist Boys School, so they, they have a swimming club. The school doesn't have a swimming pool like some of you. You've got swimming pool in the school, international school, I don't know. I went to the school with a swimming pool. So you join a swimming club. You cannot be swimming in the Padang, is it? You've got to swim in the swimming pool. So we went to this nearest swimming club called the Well Swimming Pool. That's where Pavilion Shopping Mall uh, is now. So there was a swimming pool. So I still remember I went there, I need to learn swimming. Okay, so this is just like uh, the, the well swimming pool, right? So they provided uh, a swimming uh, coach trainer. So I want to learn swimming. So this is like a pool, then uh, on top of the pool. So I, I still remember um, there was actually a, a lady, lady coach, right? Oh, very firm one, not very sexy one, okay? Very firm coach. <laughs> So he said, okay, go and swim, berenang. So I swam, lah, I swam, then come back. You know, because I didn't know how to swim. So uh, we are very afraid of water if you don't know how to swim. So you are so afraid that you either sing or you drink a lot of water, then you sing. Okay? Then, uh, um, so I swam freestyle and then my head I put on above the water all the time, 50 meters like that. So this coach standing like that. So I was swimming towards her. So he said, Kepala, turun. So I tried, no? I went there, I come back. So my head is still above the water. So she was not happy no? because she already told me, Kepala, turun. No? I said, You the mouth turun, Kepala, nanti saya gantung batu. You know what I mean? If you don't put down your head under the water, I will hang stone to your neck. What does it mean? Hang stone, that means make sure force your head to go down. So that, that, that reminds me until now, you know, when I swim or teach people to swim, you know, I tell people that don't worry, put down your head. If not, I'm kantong batu. Now that brings us to a warning in the Bible. This is in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. Now Jesus Christ has given us this warning. I do not know when you read to this passage whether you come to this or not. The Bible says, 
Jesus says, But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, some are translation to say to fall, but some translation fall into sin or commit sin. So Jesus says, It would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's a photo of a millstone. Okay? Now, I still remember when I was young, my, my grandmother was like probably half nyonya, so she loves to make chili. You know, the, nowadays you don't buy chili, you giling also, you press button one. Those days, gonna giling chili, you know, with that kind of stone. Sometimes she asked me the giling, uh, very difficult, very heavy. Okay. So just now I say the swimming coach, I say gantong batu already, so afraid. Huh? But Jesus said, lagi worse than the, my swimming coach. Jesus said, I will hang millstone. You know what is this for? During Jesus' time, this, this is big, you know. This is to be tied to a donkey. And then you crush the olive to get oil. So what Jesus was saying is that actually if you cause any of the little ones, right, the little ones who are, who are the, 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 the young, young ones, not in terms of age only, young in faith, you know, you cause them to fall, cause them to sin, or cause them not to have a relationship with Jesus. Indirectly, it's saying that you divide the church and see what Jesus will say. He said, you better die than I judge you when later on I'm going to judge the world. How, how to assure you die? You gandong batu. Ah. You tie the millstone and then you sing. Guarantee you won't come up. Right or not? You watch any criminal or sin kind of movie, you know, people murder already want to throw in the in the ocean or the lake. They'll put stones in the in the gunny bags and tie the leg or whatever to make sure that the body won't float up in that. I didn't say this, huh? Jesus said this, huh? Jesus said this. Jesus has warned every one of us. Don't be funny. He said he said you better die. Meaning to say Jesus loves you. La. Don't want you to sin more. Come home earlier. <laughs> Rather than you continue to sin because you're going to be judged, you know. If you continue to sin, continue to divide the church, you continue to cause people to fall, cause people to sin, cause people to leave the church, cause people to leave church, love, leave God. He said, better that you die. Meaning to say, better come home. Huh? Jesus never used a very gentle word and say, better come home. No, he said, you better die. I'm going to hang this millstone to you. Make sure that you don't stay alive. Am I right? Literally, this is what Jesus meant. I didn't add any salt, any pepper. Okay? You don't understand what is a millstone? You sure understand what is a millstone. So today, I say what is a millstone, you probably only remember blender. No. I better put a picture and show you what is a millstone. To make sure that when we sing, we will not come up again. So Jesus is saying that it's better for someone to die prematurely than to leave and lead his children astray. It would be better to suffer the terrible consequences of drowning and ending life early than to face much greater negative consequences God will judge us. So brothers and sisters in Christ, let me warn you this. Do not form factions in the church. Many believe them to be righteous, but many of their actions will lead to division of the church. You really want to form a small group, go to Pastor Cho and say, I want to form a live group, to disciple group. Don't be a secret group there and cause people to leave the church or divide the church. Sometimes I just wonder, aren't you afraid when we all need to face Jesus one day? We need to be accountable to Jesus, am I right? If one day when Jesus comes to judge all of us, Jesus asks you, hey, in MEC, what do you do? Right? Well, how are you going to answer? Right? So in conclusion, Paul urged the believers of Ephesians and all of us Christians to live Christian lives. Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 in those verses encourages us to walk in humility, to walk in gentleness, patience, and love that Jesus Christ has modeled to us all of us. Because Jesus Christ is humble. Jesus Christ is gentle. Jesus Christ is patient. And Jesus Christ himself is love. 
He also emphasized the importance of maintaining consistency in the Holy Spirit to peaceful union. The Spirit is peace. Jesus himself is peace. So we need to be stay united in harmony and in peace so that we can stay one peace as the body of Christ. We don't want to break into pieces. Paul urges believers to strive to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the union of peace. That is what he said. Overall, this passage emphasizes the importance of unity among believers and encourages us to strive for harmony and peace in our relationship that reflects the character of Christ. Brothers and sisters, we all know that this is the time, it's the end time now. And this is now the season that all churches must come together. All churches must work together. Despite your denomination, right? You go up to heaven, there's no angel ask you, show me your membership, Methodist. Uh. <laughs> Lutheran? Are you Catholic or what? That's a joke about, uh, what you call that, um, <clears throat> um, you know, when Jesus come again. Uh, um, so everybody is already in, uh, in heaven already. Then they suddenly the angels realize, uh, rapture that time, uh, how come the Methodists are still not here yet? Then one of the person tell the angel, they are still having their meetings. <laughs> you don't catch a joke. Uh. Methodists love to have meetings. Don't go and tell my president. <laughs> so brothers and sisters, let's work together. The kingdom of God is not limited to one local church. We need to have kingdom mindset. We need to have kingdom view. The kingdom is not just mega CMC, not MEC, it's not KLCMC, it's not CAC. The kingdom is actually for all of us to be united as a body of Christ, come together, work together. We need to know that our common enemy of the church is outside the church, not within the church. The enemy is Satan. We all know that, the devil, who prevents the church from sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and who prevents people from saving souls. The souls are unsaved souls who have not believed in Jesus Christ. Satan has also tempts Christians into not having an intimate relationship with God. So brothers and sisters in Christ, our enemies are not our brothers and sisters in Christ in the family of God, in the body of Christ. Amen. So go and tell the person next to you, you are not my enemy. The enemy is not in the church. Go and tell the person next to you. So make sure that you are genuine. <laughs> Last slide. Okay, my AI is functioning slow. <laughs> if the church is not united, it will soon be destroyed by Satan. If the church is not united, Satan will also destroy our families. And if the church is not united, the family is destroyed, our life will also be destroyed by our enemies, that is Satan. So we cannot withstand the attacks of the devil. And we cannot be sought and lied we will not be able to shine for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray.